eliminated again in the first round, make it six straight years. Oh, for their last 10 knockout games in the playoffs. Very long time without a cup. We'll talk about one player's regular season and his playoffs and whether or not we should start having some doubts. Another player who hugged all his teammates off the ice yesterday. Has he played his last game in the National Hockey League? Or has he played his last game with that team? If so, is he coming to Montreal and the game's biggest star carried his team on the back when they needed him most in Game 7? We'll discuss this and so much more. I'm Marinaro. It's the Sick Podcast Sunday version. Brunching with Marinaro, I bring in hockey historian, Leon McGuire. Turn up your volume, because you're about to listen to The Sick Podcast, with Tony Maradero, the sickest Montreal Canadiens podcast. And now, a 24th Stanley Cup banner will hang from the rafters of the famous forum in Montreal. The Canadians win the Stanley Cup. Sports Entertainment. Like no other. Brought to you by 8.6 Beer. Intense by nature. Marinero, the Sick Podcast Sunday version. Good morning, everyone. How is everyone doing today? The Toronto Maple Leafs have been eliminated. The Boston Bruins have been eliminated. I guess for Canadians fans, this is as good as gets. I bring in probably the biggest Montreal Canadiens fan in the world, as I would imagine. Hockey historian Liam McGuire, what's going on? All good, buddy. All good. That was uh, that was a hell of a run of three games yesterday. I watched every single second of them all, yeah, and uh, enjoyed them all immensely. So did I. Uh, what amazing hockey we were witness to. Let's start with the Leafs. Game seven at home in front of their fans. You had a feeling this was going to happen, Liam. After they had a chance to close out Game six, and they did not. Uh, they had a 3-2 lead in Game 6 in Tampa. Uh, Kucherov tied it up in the third. Braden Point scored the winner. And Tampa Bay forces a Game 7. They go to Toronto, and they play Game 7. And Braden Point gets hurt in period number one. In period number two, he tries to go. He can't. He decides to sit on the bench the rest of the game uh, to cheer on his teammates, basically, and to lead in his own way. And without Braden Point... Without Braden Point, Tampa Bay beats Toronto in front of their fans. The Leafs have now been eliminated in the first round for six straight seasons. Your thoughts? Well, I actually thought they were they were going to find a way to get it done prior to game time last night. I, I just had a feeling that it would stay true to how the series had kind of gone. Not quite like Carolina and Boston were all the home team ones, but... Uh, I I felt, I feel, I think as most, that Toronto were overall through the seven games were the better team territorially, zone yeah. entries, puck possession, all the metrics. Except yeah. where it mattered most on the scoreboard for four out of seven games. So it went as it, I mean, Vasilevsky was the wall last night and yeah. they they were able to stymie the Leafs on that first power play. That's when I really thought, okay, they're, they're in trouble. Then when Point went out, I went, oh my God. Here we go. And Kucherov was invisible last night. It's funny. Talk about those guys. He really was, yes. in game six. Yeah. Invisible. So, you know, he's, he's hurting too with something, whatever it may be. He's out there trying it. Uh, just like Dreisaitl at Edmonton. It's this time of year, right? We all know now. We didn't know yeah. maybe at the time how badly hurt Shea Weber was, but we know now for him to go through what he did with Montreal last year. So this is not uncommon. It's gone on since the history of time. And seemingly so has it been with the Leafs losing. It seems like it's been forever. They just find another way to do it. And, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, Tony, I mean, uh, last year, I think a lot got hung on Marner and Matthews with Tavares getting hurt first game but with the yeah. um, Corey Perry hit. But uh, Matthews played okay last night, but he didn't score. He had four shots on net. Marner controlled the puck and, and did so many good things. Didn't even get a shot on net. And then you, you watch the Edmonton game and you see what McDavid did. And look, not any, but there's nobody else on the planet in his in his realm. But that's what the great players have to do. You got to find a way. And when it's all said and done, maybe years from now we talk about Matthews and Marner and one time when they did get it done, like Ovi in 2018 or whatever. 
Yeah. But right now, they're not getting it done when they really needed to get it done. And the Leafs don't have the goaltending. They don't have a team that's constructed, I believe, had they even beat that Tampa team. I'll finish on this note, Tony, then back to you. Sure. This, Tam- this Tampa team, to me, are not even remotely close to the team that's the back-to-back Stanley Cup champions. Not even in the same stratosphere, in my opinion. I think Florida is going to walk them. Now, we'll see. Maybe I'm dead wrong. Maybe Tampa wins. Maybe they go to overtime game seven. Maybe it goes lead six. I don't know. But this is not the same Tampa team at all. And you know what no one talks about? The Canadians decimated injuries, COVID, and the key guys that were out. Just like Tampa, they played until Wednesday night, July 7th. Tampa had enough depth of lineup to carry them through what by their standards was not mediocre, but nothing outstanding. In terms of a regular season, they didn't even open up an home ice advantage, for God's sake. Yeah. And 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 here they are. They they end up beating Toronto. So so there you have it. Um, it, it, it is what it is, man. The Leafs find another way. It's uh, brunch and when Marinero will be celebrating uh, our one-year anniversary. And uh, we're going to do that on uh, Saturday, May the 21st. So I hope you can join us. And if you want to RSVP 731. 731- 2020 is the number to call. Uh, the show, of course, is brought to you by 8.6 Beer, intense by nature for those uh, who follow their instinct and live their passions in order to make their mark. So thank you very much to them. Uh, we are live on social media right now on Twitter at Tony Mar- at uh, no, pardon me, at the, at the Sick Podcast. Uh, if you want to follow me, that's at Tony Marinero and uh, on Facebook at the Sick Podcast as well. You can also follow us on Instagram at the Sick Podcast and Subscribe to our YouTube page at The Sick Podcast. All right. You know, Liam, I have to say this, though. The way the Leafs lost this year compared to other years, even though this isn't the same Tampa Bay team, it's still the defending two-time Stanley Cup champions. And I think they stepped up more than they have in previous years. I really do. It's a game that could have gone either way. Yep. I get that too. Having said that, at one point you got to win, right? You just got to do it. And I don't know what changes are going to be made, but I'm going to say this. As I look back now, I think they were better off keeping Kadri. And that difference in salary between Kadri and, uh, and John Tavares yep. put that towards a defenseman or goaltending. Now, you know, I don't think goaltending is the be-all, end-all. Mind you, I wouldn't want to play a Game 7 versus Vasilevsky. But Toronto, to me, they're just a team that is not willing to pay the price enough, and they're not balanced enough. And so I think they continue to lose the same way, with a lack of balance. And that's on Dubis, because yes. I think that move backfired. Yes. It has. Uh, the proof's in the pudding. And you're bang on and everything there. I, I don't think there's any Leaf fan right now or anybody who watches the game or hockey would say that that was a huge loss in letting Kadri go. A huge loss. They overpaid Johnny T. Big signing. Bringing the kid home. All the hoopla. I, I, I mean, everything probably at the time looked like the right idea. You were going to absolutely smother teams with offense. We had a team out of the West named the Edmonton Oilers in the 1980s, which did that pretty successfully albeit under the auspices of the greatest offensive force, arguably in force in sports, in, in yeah. Wayne Gretzky. But still, the supporting cast was pretty good, and they were quite comfortable winning games 10-7 and could care less about a game ending in their on their favor 2-1. to one. So uh, maybe if you Dubas... Can't, you can't thought, win that way in the National Hockey League now. You, you, uh, you know, you win more often than not with offense over the last two years. Goals are up, but... When you play game sevens, usually they're not offensive games, and you're going to have to win those one-goal games in a game seven, and they don't know how to win those. No, they haven't as of yet, have they? So uh, we, we, we've seen them, as I said. Uh, you could almost write a book on their losses, given the nature of them. Now, I agree with you. Look, this isn't like last year's to Montreal, where they went quietly into the night, and other years where they, they had some of the greatest collapses in sports in, in history, as we know, they, 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 this year, they were much more competitive. Absolutely. I have full measure. I think over the course of the seven games, Tony, I think they were the better team. 
I feel Toronto was the better team. At the end yeah. of the day, they didn't win four out of seven. They won three. They didn't win the fourth. So they had home ice advantage. You got the last change. They had three power plays. Tampa had two. People crying about the on, about the goal call back. Give me a break. Any pick play that leads to a scoring chance is called 101 out of 100 times. Like with, with Leaf fans, it's always one of two ways. It's either the officials or oh, we ran into a hot goalie. Like it's they never look internally. That's just from the fan boy, uh, fan yeah. point of view. For us, just looking at it, hey, look, they didn't get it done. They were as good or better than this edition of Tampa. We'll see just yeah. exactly what this edition is in the next series here. And and right now we can look back and say, okay, Dubas, this is on him. Shanahan hired him over Mark Hunter. Lou Lamarillo left because he didn't want to be a figurehead. Say what you want about Lou on the island, okay, and everything else. That's a whole other story. But the fact is, is that Shanahan made his bed with Dubas, and here you are. So you got to look at this internally now yeah. and decide, is, is, are they going to think that, okay, two-time cup champs, uh, we lost a tight one, well, let's roll the dice one more time, make some cosmetic changes. Or do you look at doing something drastic, either off with the off-ice product, and because on-ice would be more difficult, doable but more difficult, and uh, now we wait and see what their off-season uh, entails. Yeah, listen, the difference, also one of the differences uh, we talked about, I think Tampa Bay had more players who were willing to pay the price, number one. Number two, obviously, they had Vasilevsky in a tight game. You trust him. Number three, they had Victor Hedman, and they threw that horse on the ice every chance they got, and Toronto just doesn't have a horse like that because Morgan Riley is a different kind of player. I think Morgan Riley is maybe more a regular season kind of player. Victor Hedman is regular season and playoffs. And the other thing is the power play. Tampa Bay's power play, I think, was like over 21%, and Toronto's power play was under 13%. And and that's the difference there. Toronto scored one more goal than Tampa in the series, I believe. But the couple of goals they needed in Game 7, if it wasn't going to come 5-on-5, five five, it needed to come on the power play, right? and it didn't. Here's a couple of – look, first of all, here's um, a couple of uh, tweets that came out last night and a couple of charts. Let's put them up for those who are watching live. Two th- – 20,102 days since a cup. 6,699 days since winning a playoff series. 812 days since losing to an AHL Zamboni driver. There you have it. My God. Uh, That's a a tweet that uh, says it all, doesn't it? Yeah, that's uh, that, that guy's quite famous on Twitter. Um, for po- he posts this. He just updates it every day. He sometimes he changes it up a little bit, but those are typically the three that he, uh, or two of the three anyway that he goes with since the last cup in '67 and the Zamboni driver. They're always on there. He changes them up a little bit, but certainly a guy who's having a lot of fun at Leafs' expense. And and it is an easy thing to do right now. And you started off your show by saying good day for Hab fans with Toronto and Boston both going out. I mean, in Ottawa already out of the playoffs. It's the three biggest rivals geographically. Uh, historically with Toronto and Boston. So, you know, in that sense, I mean, hey, you know, it it, it is what it is. I, I I don't I grew up as a kid as a hardcore Hab fan wanting the Leafs to go 0 and 80. Like like there was no love loss when I was 10, 12 or 14. I'll be 63 a week from today. I don't have that same hatred. They got all sorts of guys on that roster that I'm fans of and 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 look, had there been I'm Olympics really, this year, Riley and Marner would have been on the team. So I, I, you know. I'm with you, Liam. In a way, it is kind of funny to see everyone gathered outside and the disappointment again. But at the same time, I find it kind of sad. And if they would have won, to be brutally honest with you, I would have been happy with them. I like Austin Matthews as a player. I like Mitch Marner as a oh, yeah. player. I like John Tavares as a player. I like Morgan Riley as a player. I like Giordano. I think Spets has had a real good career. Uh, so... You know, I don't dislike, you can probably dislike the Toronto's in the news too much. You can dislike that Toronto gets too much hockey coverage. That's not the Maple Leafs' fault. So, listen, it's, it's funny that you're saying this this morning because I've been talking about this for a couple of weeks, all right? And I've been getting obliterated by it. But, you know, that hate we used to have for the Leafs, first of all, it's nowhere close that the hate any Montrealer or Canadians fan used to have for the Boston Bruins. It's nowhere close that any Montreal or, or a Canadians fan used to have for the Quebec Nordiques. And today they play a brand of hockey that's pretty exciting. Now, they weren't able to get it done 
The 60 goal scorer wasn't able to get it done, but the best player in the world, Connor McDavid, and let there be no doubt now that he is the best player in the world for those who had doubts, because if he would have got eliminated last night, you would have said, yeah, he's not the best player in the world. Connor McDavid put on a show last night in Edmonton and Philip Deneau at one point and, and none of the Kings, they just couldn't, they could only handle it for so long they could contain him a little bit, but they couldn't sustain it. And uh, Connor McDavid picks up an assist on the first goal, scores the second goal. He single-handedly carried his team on his back. So with that win, let's update playoff series one. It's been updated now. If we can bring it up. Number of playoff series won by Canadian teams in the last decade. Montreal, eight. Vancouver, Four, Ottawa, three, Winnipeg, three, Edmonton, two, Calgary, one, with a chance to make it two tonight when they play game seven versus Dallas, Toronto, zero. These stats are, are mind-boggling, really, right? There's, there's, there's no excuse for Toronto, who had the luxury of drafting in the top five. Matthews, one. Marner at four, Riley five, and they're mm-hmm. still there. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, you know, the draft is a different animal altogether, and I think they got some beauties in those guys. They've got a foundation there, and this was a hell of a team. They had a hell of a regular season, and they played the two-time defending cup champs. I'm saying they're a shadow of what they were. Regardless, they are the two-time defending cup champs, and it went to seven games, and it was a 2-1 game. So you get in all the rest of it, and everything you just you've pointed out, <laughs> whether it be the stat before with the number of days, all that, and right now the series won. It goes to show you how hard we are, we are as Hab fans on our team. And yet you look at that, at least from a Canadian perspective, and it, it is kind of an eye-opener if people haven't really gone back and reflected or taken a look at that statistically of how Montreal's chipped away at a series here, series there, just haven't been able to do much and then that great run last year and not notwithstanding 2014 right if Kreider doesn't run price who knows it is you know uh, it's the old story you just you said it yourself Tony you got to find a way sometimes to get it done you got to find a way and when you got a nucleus you got a good team and you think you're well coached and your specialty teams that's another great point you made as well they led the play they led the regular season in in power play now you come down here at 13%. It's not good enough. As they, not should, good enough. as they should with Tavares, with Matthews, with Marner, with Nylander, Absolutely. with Riley. You just have to put yep. those five guys on the ice all the time. Absolutely. And they the three of them play almost a full two minutes. So it's, it's uh, it, it, you know, I mean, yeah, uh, Vasilevsky, they, they, they stepped up and beat this Toronto team. We'll see what they got left for Florida, who had their own challenges there uh, against Washington. But... You see that all the time. Remember when the Hawks won the Cup in 2013? They barely got by Nashville in the first round. Yeah. I mean, this happens all the time. When LA won in 2012, they were down three to San Jose. Like, it, 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 the teams come back and find ways to get things done. They get on a roll. Guys take a team like Connor did last night. Now, he's the best player in the world, but... He has he has got a lot of detractors as much as so many oh, of us. Yeah, yes, he does. You know, like you hit it the nail on the head there as well. Had they lost last night, all of the talk, the people who go either the ones who are in Matthews' camp because Matthews will probably win the Hart Trophy, Connor will win the Ted Lindsay going away, and you know the people in the Matthews camp or God forbid think another name. And they would use that as fodder to say, look, he's not getting it done. He's not proving he is all that. Well, last yeah. night he did, you know, and we just lost on April 22nd one of the players in the history of this league who got it done as well when he was the best player in the game. Yeah. He turned it up in Gila Fleur and got it done in his prime a number of times. When he was yeah. the best player on the best team. And this is what you got to do, man. If I can, and, Liam, if uh, I can. And Toronto aren't there. Yeah, in 76, uh, with uh, the fact that he was, remember, they they they, um, 
they were yeah, going right. to they were going to kidnap him and hold him hostage. Uh, organized crime was, uh, yeah. and Guy Lafleur was was going around with bodyguards, and the Flyers wanted to intimidate him. Guy Lafleur scores the game winning goal to end the series versus the Flyers. The Canadians win the Stanley Cup in 1977 with Mike Milbury saying he's going to take Guy Lafleur's head off and wincing, calling him a chicken. He goes to Boston for game three, two goals and two assists and a 4-2 win and sets up Jacques Lemaire's game-winning goal in overtime. In 1979, with less than 90 seconds to go in game seven and the Canadians trailing by a score of four to three, Guy Lafleur ties up that game at four. So uh, I'm not a hockey historian or a trivia buff like yourself, but I do know a little bit about Guy Lafleur. Look, we're going to talk Habs in about two minutes. We're also going to get to all of your questions so you can start sending them in. If you love this podcast, comment sick, enter, sick, and then enter, and sick, and then enter. Keep on telling us it's sick, because if you do, then we know that you absolutely love it. But before we do, I want you to take a look at this picture of Austin Matthews and this picture of Toronto Maple Leafs fans lined out outside, lined up outside uh, Leafs, uh, on Lee Square. Look at Matthews, all right, and look at the fans, all right? The, my question for you in ending is, Something's bound to give in Toronto. A, what do you think is going to happen? B, what would you do? You asking me? Yeah. So what do you think is going to happen in Toronto? I think very little, actually. I, th I think they'll, I think they're going to try and figure out a way to, um, if, if it's possible, they're going to try and figure out a way to upgrade their goaltending. And they're going to try and figure out a way to uh, add to bolster their defense. They may, they may entertain some thoughts about seeing if there's a way they could dangle Tavares. Um, you know, they, they've got some guys that I really like. I, I really like Bunting as a player. Uh, I, I think there's a number of guys. Engvall, there's a couple guys, but you know, they didn't. They weren't able to score when they needed them as secondary scoring. But I like him as a player. He's a rookie. He won't win the Calder, but he's voted top three, rightfully so. They've got a lot of nice pieces, but I think they'll end up, Tony, I think they'll do very little other than probably cosmetically, and they may, I think, source around and see if there's some bites maybe for Tavares. What would I do? I, I would let Kyle Dubas go today. That's what I would do. Wow. He, he, this, he's responsible for this, and there's... He has misidentified what is needed as a core to win the Stanley Cup. You said the, guy, the guys they had top five, uh, you, 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 they've, they've brought in coaches, they've, they've surrounded Matthews, they've got the best season out of these guys, and I do not think he's a general manager to take them going forward. Not in my opinion. All right. Um, Sheldon Keefe is uh, safe. Yeah, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't think uh, uh, Punch Imlac in 1962, well, maybe him in 62 or 3 or 4, okay, he would have scared the bejesus out of those guys that they would have got a win on home ice last night. That, that Leaf team played out uh, almost out of fear. But you know what? All they did was win when the games mattered the most at that time. So short of Punch Imlac, yeah, I don't think any other coach for Toronto – was going to go in there and 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 get anything more out of that roster in 2022. I I, I don't I don't necessarily blame him. Yeah. Dubas is the guy. The, the buck has to stop going up the line. And at some point, this will this will be on on Shanahan. I mean, we yeah. all heard it. We all heard it when he brought in Babcock. It was the Shanahan plan. They all they said the right things. The very first quote out out of their mouths was, "There's going to be pain," and there was. They finished last, and they got Matthews. You yeah. know, and, they uh, got they got a mini sort of generational guy. He just yeah. became the first sixty goal scorer in ten years. Like he, other, he's all he's all world. He's phenomenal. Yeah, but he didn't get it done last night. You know, you got to find a way, man. Go down hockey history, right from Joe Malone right to Connor McDavid. Those guys who were reputed to be, or were statistically, or were known to be the best found a way to get it done. And that's Speaking the big of, challenge for them. And Kyle Dubas, as a yeah. manager, has failed this team. He has failed this team as a manager, in my opinion. On the other hand, Julian Brisebois, props to him because Hagel 
uh, came up big, and especially Nick Paul, who scored. You know, you go out and you acquire a guy on trade deadline, and he's the guy who scores the two goals in Game 7, and you see him sacrificing and throwing his body around. I thought he was absolutely amazing. Okay, before we get to – actually, let's get to the Canadians now. Patrice Bergeron, Brad Marchand talked about – Bergeron was hugging his teammates off the ice. He was saying, I'm telling him, you know, I'm, I'm trying to convince him to come back. So now people are wondering, is Patrice Bergeron going to retire or is he going to join the Montreal Canadiens as an unrestricted free agent and be named captain of the Montreal Canadiens? Your thoughts? Well, I think there's a, um, I really legitimately think there's a 50-50 chance. I wouldn't give it any higher than that. But I, I think, and I think that's a pretty high percentage, actually, from my point of view, Tony. I think there's a 50-50 chance. He does come to Montreal. I, I, I think he knows he's on the back nine of his career. I think he also knows internally that there isn't any more gas to give in Boston. They can make they can move a few pieces around. They've got a nice team. They're probably a playoff team next year as well. But they're no more of a threat than, really, frankly, most of the teams that missed the playoffs this year. He could come back to the province. He could come back because of his relationship to Hughes. I would not like to see him get to see but uh, that's just me personally speaking. But I think there's a 50-50 chance that that, that may happen. I really you do. Want, you don't want the seat to go to a Boston Bruin, eh? Is that it? No, I don't want it to go to a guy cup being parachuted in on the back nine of his career just because he is all of that, you know? I think because he's been carrying the C there, replaced Z, deserved it there. He's got a Bruin implanted on his chest, rightfully so. The perfection line and everything he's meant for it. You're going to come back to the province, back to Kent Hughes, Everything else has got a feel-good story. And I don't know, man. I, 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 You know, it's not that he was a Bruin. I, it, it's it's just, to me, give him a C. But then, you know, are you going to turn around and give it to Suzuki and have him a captain with Bergeron there? No. You're going to give it to Gallagher? Well, you know, maybe you go another year without one. That's one i got to sit down and have a couple pints and think about. Wow. But, First of all, they're not going to go another year without a captain. But here's an unpopular opinion, but I'll give it anyway. I take Patrice Bergeron on my team any day of the week, twice on Sundays. But I take him, especially if I'm a cup contender, he puts me over the top. He comes here, they're not a cup contender. And as much as I love Patrice Bergeron, I'd rather have a chance at Bedard, at Michkov, or Fantilli, and they're going to be with me for the next 10 years than Patrice Bergeron for the next two years when they're not going to make the playoffs anyway. And even if they would, they're not going to be very good. All right, Shane Wright, his regular season stats. You ready? Let's right. bring him up. Uh, OHL stats. Shane Wright finished eighth in the regular season with 94 points, 30 points off of Wyatt Johnston, uh, who finished number one. His Kingston front necks were eliminated yesterday. He picked up a goal in a 6-5 loss. Let's take a look at his playoff stats. 11 games, three goals, 11 assists, 14 points. Shane Wright was not great in the playoffs. They're pretty good stats, but he wasn't great. There were a couple of nights where he wasn't very good. There was at least one game where he was probably uh, reportedly the worst player on the ice. Are you concerned? How many times have you had a chance to see Shane Wright play live? Um, are you concerned or are you not? And would he be your number one pick? I, I don't know enough about Cooley. And uh, can you pronounce the, the other guy's name, Tony? Klapkowski. Yeah. Uh, I, I just, I haven't seen them enough. Uh, Shane Wright plays for Kingston. I probably caught him uh, three times, four times live coming in here to play the 67s. I went to quite a few of their games this year, specifically to see him and also to uh, Peterborough games to see Mason McTavish, even though he was drafted. But uh, I just wanted to get a look at some of these guys as they were coming in. Shane more imper and, you know, importantly because he hadn't been picked and, and obviously, I've watched like most probably and seen him on TV where he lit it up under 18. And then we haven't really seen that type of explosion of him since. Is he going to go number one? I mean, it certainly sounds like Montreal will probably select him. But, you know, uh, the Montreal Canadiens since 2005, not including the 2021 draft. So 15-year run from 05 to 2020 have drafted 115 players. 42 of them have made the NHL. I'm not talking about just with the Habs. 42, that's 39%. And compare that to Tampa Bay, the two-time defending Stanley Cup champion, drafted 122 players 
in the same amount of time and put 53 in the NHL. Marginally better only. Marginally better. However, there's 11 guys on that Tampa roster right now that were draft picks. 11 guys that have been on this cup-winning team. Not including the guys that have been on the team that they traded away to get the guys that are on the roster right now. There's another three. So the management and the selection of the players is what's critically important, as we all well know. Now, we've moved out from Bergevin and Timmins. There is, a, there is a difference, though. Here. Liam, if I can, there's a difference. The Canadians never drafted a Stamkos. The Canadians never drafted a Hedman. The Canadians never drafted a Kucherov. The Canadians never drafted a Braden Point. Uh, I'll end it there. Vasilevsky Price. Hold, hold, on, the hold, that- hold on, hold on. You can't you can't throw Braden Point's name in there. He was he was selected 79th overall. Here's the thing. You want to get into semantics about the differences. Braden Point's drafted as an 18 year old. In his 19 year old year, he comes up from Moose Jaw and plays in the American Hockey League playoffs. He plays nine games, gets four points. He goes to camp for Tampa last year. Historically, what we've seen in Montreal is they keep those guys. Yeah. Well, not, not Tampa. They send him back to junior. He lights it up and he goes to the World Juniors. Then he comes into Tampa and now he's this force. Now, Montreal didn't draft him because they didn't have the presence of mind to draft him. He went 79th overall, Tony, not first or second like Stamkos or Hedman. Yeah. I mean, yeah, they had the benefit of some high picks, but. And Kucherov didn't go first or second overall either. I know, but like, so it, listen, it, you can make the argument that they found those guys and the Canadians didn't, even though you can make the argument that it's probably a little bit of fluke. But let me ask you this. Let's say the Canadians draft Shane Wright. Should he start in Montreal or go back to Kingston? Because I have my opinion on this one. I have a very strong opinion, too, and I'm telling you exactly what I'm going to base it on. I'm going to base it on the World Juniors in August, and I'm going to base it on how he looks in Montreal's rookie camp where I went to games last year, and I'll go to games this year as well. And I will make my own assessment as a guy who follows the game like I do, and I trust what I see when I see. And yeah. and I will make my determination then. You're asking me right now today, there's not a hope in hell he should be on that Montreal roster opening night. But I will determine that when I see him play in the World okay. Juniors in August, even though it's a bit of a bastardized version of, w- of what it typically is, it's still going to be a lot of the better players. And then I'll see how he looks in the rookie camp. And they'll probably bring him because he's first overall. Unless he falls flat on his face, he's yeah. going to the main camp regardless. But yeah. no, Tony, today, as of right now, today, he, there, there, there's no way. I, I would much rather him. He lost a year to COVID, yeah. as all those guys did, uh, you know, with the canceled hockey. Hit the best place for him is doing exactly what Tampa Bay did with Braden Point. Even though Wright's first and Tampa was 79, or Point was 79th. Do the right thing here. I try. I, right now, I'm putting my trust in Kent Hughes and Jeff Gordon. I'll make the determination already. I want to see him go back to Kingston. Uh, if he makes the National Hockey League right away in October, plays his first game, he'll be 18 years old and nine months. Suzuki came up at 20 years old and two months. Suzuki spent four years in the Amer- Ontario Hockey League. Shane Wright, three, but missed one because of COVID, like you talked about. I like to see him do what Suzuki did and lead his team to the OHL championship and be the playoff MVP. So for me, um, I've never seen a player get burned by spending an extra year in junior, but I have seen players get burned by coming up to the National Hockey League one year too soon. So I don't care how he looks in, in training camp. Latan Dress looked great in training camp. Ribeiro looked great in training camp. We realized it was too soon. Uh, the veterans coast in training camp anyway. They don't even want to play the, the preseason games. Hey, you still got 10 games, though. You know, yeah. I mean, you got 10 games. Ottawa did that with Marion Hosa. And he's a Hall of Famer. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, they sent him back. They sent Jason Spezza back. You know, I mean, there's there's lots of examples of guys who sort through camp for the very reasons you're saying. And then before game 10, because you had the right personnel running yeah. the organization, they sent guys back. So, you know, I don't disagree with you, Tony, strongly if you're making that case now, but yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll reserve judgment till I see him in, in August, although I'm kind of expecting that, no, I don't think he'll probably look as good as we all will hope, but yeah. I'll reserve judgment till then. I want to do something, okay? I want to take this seven minutes longer, okay? And I want to take question after question after question after question. I want you to answer each question in less than 15 seconds so we get to as many as possible. Is that okay? All right. Okay. All right, go. First question. Jimmy, 666, Tony, there are rumors out there that the Habs have links to Pierre-Luc Dubois. Is it true? And if so, what would it take to land uh, the big Frenchman? Okay, so he's RFA. So, Liam. I've heard nothing. 
Uh, I think there's zero chance of that happening. All right, next. Jeff, do you think it's possible to trade Petrie without having to retain salary or take a back contract? Liam. I would say uh, highly unlikely that you're not going to have to give to get something to get Petrie off the books. Next. Michael Foresta keeps seeing rumors of Fiala being traded. Wouldn't he be a great acquisition for the Habs? Liam. Minnesota Wild are in cap hell. I think Fiala's days are numbered. Montreal is a destination. I, I don't see it. Next. Corey McNeil, do you think the Habs are undoubtedly drafting Shane Wright in your guys' opinion? I would say yes, Liam. How about you? Yeah, I, I, I feel they will as well. Next. Uh, Jason Party, hey, Tony and Liam, if Price doesn't come back next season and the Habs end up needing a goaltender, what do you think of trading Yol Armia to the Leafs for Peter Mrazek? The dollar amount is similar on both contracts, but Mrazek has one year less remaining on his. Liam. Well, I guess exchange four quarters for a dollar. I mean, Armia looks like he's playing his way off the roster all but assuredly. And Morazic doesn't look like he's got the, the, the wherewithal to, to, to help out much other than another Band-Aid solution that we need in Montreal and net if we have to start or go or possibly have the end of Carey Price's career. Goaltending is going to be an issue here in the short term for the Montreal Canadiens. Next. Jason, again. Hey, guys, if the Canadiens don't sign Jaden Struble this summer, will they lose him? No, yes. they have one. Well, they have one. Uh, yeah, four years. Yeah. Yeah. Four years. Okay, next. Uh, Gaetan says, uh, my opinion that the Habs have to trade Petrie, Drouin, and Armia, even though they uh, lose out on those trades. Tony, do you agree? Well, I, I, I think all three of those guys are not going to be part of the Montreal Canadiens' future as they climb out of the depths that they're in right now. So, however and whenever they're dealt or moved is going to happen. It's just a question of when. I don't think we're going to get everything happening overnight here in Montreal. Very, I know Tony, 15 seconds, but look, yeah. I very much am hoping too that they're in the Bedard sweepstakes, not because I want us to be brutal next year, yeah. but I, first of all, I just think they're going to be there. I think they're Hold going to be there anyway. It's not that I want that. It's just what I think they're going to be. I'm thinking of something. After you draft a player who's playing out of the States, he can play four years there. So Struble had three years at Northeastern. So I think he can play one more year. It's just that uh, yeah. he, one more year. So, but I mean, the question is, do you think they lose him? Technically, he can play one more year at Northeastern and the Canadians would have to sign him next year the way they just did with Jordan Harris. Correct? Am I there? Yeah, I, I forgot he'd only had the three. That's yeah, right. Yeah, three years he's got there. Okay, all right. Uh, next. David, uh, podcast is sick. If the Habs don't make major changes with a healthy team plus right, Harris, Barron on the blue line, Allen, Montembeau, and Nets, where do the Habs finish next season? Liam. I, I tell you what, I think the Habs are being grossly undersold in terms of how they're building this defense for the future. I am so pumped about what's coming on the blue line for this team in the next 12 to 24 months. But I, I still think we're finishing bottom five next year, especially if we've got no price. We've got, we don't have Kerry even remotely close to 100% healthy physically and mentally. There's no solution that is exists right now with some sort of allen Montebone combination that's going to get Montreal into a wild card spot or beyond. It's not happening. Yeah, yeah. two more minutes. Let's go. Speak questions. Uh, Marco, Hughes made it clear he trades Petrie. Uh, he'll be replaced with another similar D-man for leadership on his D. Would you? Uh, who would you grab for Petrie? I, I, I'd have to give that some thought. I, I don't have a name off the top of my head. But I'd have to sit down and look at rosters at the end of the season. I say this. Forget about going out trying to sign Christopher Letang so you can be better when you're not a cup team to begin with, okay? Bring it. If you want to bring in veteran leadership, bring it. But don't bring it with a guy that's going to help you get points in the standings, right? It's not worth it, folks. Having a 35 or a 36-year-old for two more years on the back nine of their career is not worth it. You know, the opportunity of the lose out on Connor Bedard or Mitch Koff or Fantilli. I, I don't understand what people are thinking anymore. Next. Uh, B-roll, do you think, do you want to see Dallas win so the Habs get a better draft pick? Of course. Next. <laughs> Martin. Hey, Tony, love the show. Should Hugh select his son if he's still available late in the first round? Uh, I don't think he will because he doesn't want to put added pressure on him. Next one's for Liam. Curtis, do you think the Habs GM even entertains the thought of trading the number one pick? Liam? 
Uh, no, I, I can't see it unless something so ridiculous is thrown at them. No. Yeah, I don't see them trading the number one pick when they know they have to rebuild and they're hosting the draft in Montreal and they haven't had the number one pick overall since 1980. I don't see it either. Next. What's the plan for Mayu? I'd like to see him on the team. Liam? Well, no one knows what the plan is, but he's still, uh, he's still uh, you know, part of the organization at this point, recovering from an injury. He's playing great when he came back in. And I, I, I have no problem with him if Montreal give him a shot. And I'd like to see him on the blue line in the future. I think, he, I think he's a prospect that could develop nicely. Three more quick ones in 30 seconds. JF, has Liam seen Joshua Roy play? And if so, what does he think of him? Who led the Quebec Major Junior Hockey League in scoring? I saw him play once, so I can't really give you a, uh, much of a. I wish I, I wish I could have seen him more. What I what I saw that night, he looked awesome. He looked really good. Next, Angelo. Does Price finish his career as a Hab? Liam. No. And the last one, Carlos. Who will be the Habs' next veteran number one defenseman? Is it Christopher Latang? Liam. You know where I stand. Well, I liked how you said it earlier, Tony. I really think Kent Hughes and, and Jeff Gordon are, you know, you look at, it was Gordon who sent out the letter in New York. He came through that Boston organization where they were absolutely brutal in the first six, seven years of the 2000s. Gordon was the one who started drafting to turn that around. You bring in Kent Hughes. I got, I'm trusting these guys. I'm trusting these guys as a half fan to do the right thing. And I do not think the, 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 the Tang acquisition is, is the right way to go. In ending, once again, we're celebrating our one-year anniversary, which we were supposed to pack in the month of March, but because of COVID, uh, it didn't happen. And then in April, we are going to have an event, and we postponed it because members of our sick team got COVID. So if you want to RSVP and join us next week on Saturday, May 21st, 2022, at 7 o'clock for RSVP call, 514-731-2020. Liam, if you're in town, open invitation. You know that. Thanks for doing this, man. Thanks, buddy. I always appreciate it, Tony. Love being on with you. Thank you for asking. Thank you. Likewise, you're very welcome. Hockey historian and trivia buff, the great Liam McGuire. I'm Marinero. Leafs eliminated in the first round for six straight seasons, 0 for 10 in knockout games in the playoffs. Is this a joke? The podcast isn't. The podcast is sick. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow The Sick Podcast with Tony Marinero on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts. The Sick Podcast is brought to you by 8.6, intense by nature.